such a full house and such a full house that is present on the dot of time. So I welcome you all to this day-long symposium on Ikkat. And we are delighted to have with us eminent speakers and practitioners from across the globe. And in Edric's memorable words of yesterday at the inaugural event, what we hope will unwind today is how much incredible diversity there is across the globe, and yet our commonalities. And that is what we saw yesterday, and I'm sure that is going to be repeated again today. So I welcome you all, and I will now, because our, if you notice, our minute to minute is so tight that we're actually going to be very stern with all speakers, participants, and everybody else. And I will explain that to you as we go into the next session. But I want to hand over to my colleague and the mover and the shaker of this whole event, <laughs> Manjari Nirula, who will never take credit, but I have to give her the credit, <laughs> who is <laughs> Vice President, uh, South Asia, for the World Crafts Council, Asia Pacific region. So welcome to you all. And may I request if you all could all switch off your mobiles at this point. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, taking a cue from what Ritu just said, I'll be very brief. So welcome. <laughs> I have great pleasure in introducing to you Jasleen Thamija, who's an internationally, <laughs> she's an internationally renowned in the field of living cultural traditions, intangible heritage, rural non-farm development, and history of textiles and costumes. She began working in development of handicrafts and handlooms in India at the pioneering stage of, from the 50s, and she continued to work for the United Nations in Iran, Central Asia, in 21 African countries, the Balkans, South Asia, Southeast Asia, she was also a consultant to World Bank and international NGOs. She was awarded Hill Professor at the University of Minnesota, was faculty member at the National Fashion, Technolo National Fashion Technology New Delhi, resident at three universities in Australia. She has authored several books on textiles and folk art on women's employment, income generation, and was editor of volume six of the World Encyclopedia of Dress and Fashion on South Asia and Southeast Asia. Organized seminars, curated exhibitions in India and abroad, did major exhibitions at National Museum, Manila, Philippines, and Woven Magic in Indonesia, and a major exhibition on power cloths of the Commonwealth for Commonwealth Games at Melbourne in 2006 and in 2010 in Delhi. President of International Festival of Sacred Arts, Delhi. In 2000, she carried out an evaluation of UNESCO's work in crafts in the last decade and directions for the future. Was appointed president of jury for UNESCO Award for Creativity in Textiles over the past few years. Speaker at International Conference on Cultural Heritage and Development at Edinburgh Arts Festival. Co-chairperson for Handlooms and Handicraft Development Steering Committee for the 12th Five-Year Plan Planning Commission, Government of India. And I could go on. <laughs> so I have great pleasure to introduce to you Jocelyn Ji, and she has something we haven't written in this today because it's a symposium, has been actually uh, so connected with what's happening since yesterday. And thank you, Jocelyn, for that too. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. We have Edric Ong, who is the president of Society Atelier Sarawak, Arts and Crafts Society, Sarawak, Malaysia, past president, ASEAN Handicraft Promotion and Development Association, APADA, past senior vice president, advisor, for the World Crafts Council Asia Pacific region. 
architect of several landmark buildings. He is the author of several books, for example, the Sarabak style, Pua Kumbu, the Iban textiles, Woven Dreams, a cut, textiles of Sarabak. He is the founder and convener of World Ecofiber and Textiles, WEFT, network to promote natural fibers and dyes, convening the Biennale WEFT Forum. Awarded for his design and architecture, crafts, textiles, and fashion, Edric Ong is the curator of many international exhibitions. He is the panel of experts for UNESCO and jury member of UNESCO World Crafts Council Award of Excellence for Handicrafts, and more so, my partner in crime. <laughs> <laughs> I have great pleasure to introduce the two of them, and let's get on with the. Good morning, everybody. We are here to enclose you all in the embrace of the Ikat, of the Patola of the Banda, of the various names by which uh, this tradition is known. And one of the greatest contributors, can you hear me? Oops. We need to hear her thundering voice. <laughs> um, yes. Oh dear. <laughs> we were not supposed to waste time. <laughs> uh, one of the greatest contribution and contributors to in uh, to developing the awareness of the importance of this technique is Edric. Edric has been working first in Sarabakh with his research and then uh, later on spreading it out every alternate year from the 80s, right? There has been a conference from where all of us, many of us who are here today, have participated and have learnt, have shared, have given and have received. And the person who has given the most is Edric. I'm delighted that I've been asked to jointly make this presentation with my beloved friend, Edric Ong. The creation of patterns by tying and dyeing the warp and the weft threads, the bandha, is the oldest creative technique in woven fabrics throughout the world. It is a significant way to reach out to ritual observations which are a significant part of our lives. Each region has its own traditions. They all have their own symbols. And over the millenniums, these have become linked with their beliefs and the observation of the rites of passage. The Patan Patola, and we are privileged to have people who practice this ancient art and continue like a extraordinary connection with the past who are present here today. Thank you for coming and participating and sharing with us. It's the finest double ikat as along with the other which was woven in Bali, Tringana, the green thing, which is also exquisite. The Patan Patola, with its double ikat, 
has became an important part of the rites of passage of India and was used in the observation from the seventh day, uh, seventh month uh, of the development of the child in the womb of the mother. The unborn child and its mother was protected by your patola. And that continues to be practiced even today. So prior to birth, through the entire life, to the uh, last stages, we have had the patola as an important part of our lives. It also represented the power, the magic, which was, which gave great power to the temples in Kerala, Bhadrakali, the powerful Bhadrakali, with a sword in her hand, her outer walls of her temple were decorated with the patola wood. And when the patola was not available, with the designs which had been taken, and sections of the patola were taken out in the procession of Bhadrakali. So you can imagine how important you people have been in our lives and continue to be. And this is like a continuing tradition. And it was not only in India that it was important, but Patola, which was known as Chindai, right? In uh, Indonesia, in Malaysia, is mentioned in the 11th century in the annals, the Malayan annals, as a protective. And the warrior of the 11th century was supposed to be wrapped in the patola. And it was also a part of the protective cloth of the royal family in Indonesia and used by them till today, till today. It is amazing how we reach out in time and we reach into time. It is amazing. The Ikat of Urissa, known as Bandha, and we have a wonderful young lady here who has done so much work on that, has a range of techniques which are linked with the religious practices of the area. The most complex is the creation on the red silk pata of the Gita Govinda, the song of Krishna and Radha, which is the late motif of the, uh, the, uh, the temple of Puri. And the scarves are made for Lord Jagannath to be wrapped. And over their images, and they are replaced every year with great uh, celebration. In addition, the other tradition of the uh, Vachitrapuri sari, the very name itself, Vachitra, that which is unfathomable, that which is unknowable. Especially, the, it was used in their wedding celebrations, but the, especially the one which has the uh, red, black, and white squares woven in the double ikat was a sacred cloth because in case the there was 
a, a worship or a ritual had to be performed, like it used to happen, that certain rituals had to be performed on the side of the sacred river. Then, and there was no place where it could be, uh, which was sacred, by putting the sari out and including the space, it became a sacred space. And I have seen many of today, nobody. Yesterday, many people were wearing that sari. And I said, ah, there they are. As they walk, they create the sacred space. The extraordinary Indonesian archipelago has a rich range of ikat techniques which are used by the shamans. They are the ones who govern the lives and the ikat, patola, sari used to be preserved in the uh, the village temple and every year they would bring it out, spread it out and look at it and interpret from its color, from its sheen as to what is the year going to be for the village. It predicted the year and people believed in it. It was the wealth of the women. A woman, if she had a patola sari, she was enriched and nobody could take away her riches. It was what we call stridhan, the woman's wealth. And if the man misbehaved, she would threaten to leave with her textile collection and that put him on the street and narrow path. Uh, the interesting thing is that in Bali, which was a Hindu island in Indonesia, the most complex double ikat known as Gring Singh, as I mentioned, was woven by the people of Agabali. They were the original inhabitants of Bali. And it is considered by the research which has been done that they uh, came perhaps from Urissa. I will not go because there's no time mm -hmm. into uh, the research which has been carried on but there has been a lot of research and there's been a lot of research which has also been done on the sea connections and that's been done by our Dr. Dutika Vardarajan who has contributed greatly to the sea trade. Uh, the uh, Gring Singh, the dominant motive was of the square mandala with a spiral pagoda on all four sides. These were enclosed by stars, loc locating the motif within the cosmos. It also carried the figures of the Vayan. Just imagine the puppet, which has the power to protect the wearer as well as the community for the Vayan has a supernatural power as it is associated with the spirit of the ancestors. Many of these traditions are known to us, but few of us know of the extraordinary ikat which is produced in Latin America. Yesterday, Edric spoke about it. And today, he will tell us about the uh, extraordinary Latin American uh, ikat 
because the pre-Inca culture were known for their very fine quality of fabrics which were highly valued and were part of the birth, baptism, marriage and the final journey. And it's because of this perhaps that some of the finest pieces have been found in the excavations which have been carried out in Peru and Machu Picchu. Finest double ikat which has been found out. Edric knows more about it. He will tell us about it. I retrace our step back to another region, Central Asia, which has a rich tradition of ikat that is quite distinctive. The motifs are bold, worked in brilliant colors, and are taken from nature. Tulips, pomegranates, tree of life, the birds in flight ends. Yesterday, you were fortunate enough to see the wonderful collection at the fashion show which Edric brought alive, all these textiles for us. The vividness of their color, the beauty, you saw that all. And this, some say, was introduced into Central Asia during the 10th and 11th century, but some attribute it to the 18th century, later period. It's to be found in the oasis towns of Central Asia, spread over the vast desert, <coughs> which created the Ika, the rich Abra, the cloud, which captured the beauty of the rainbow and reflected it in the ikat that they uh, created. It was Bukhara, Samarkand, Fargana, uh, Margilan, and also in Khotan and in Kazakhstan, in Kyrgyzstan, it was spread and it made the desert bloom and enriched the lives of the people who lived in the desert. It's uh, interesting that Afghanistan also had a tradition and they wove uh, ikat with velvet. And the interesting thing is that UNESCO in the 80s revived it. And then, of course, Afghanistan has gone through, but an, I'm told an attempt is being made to revive. Uh, it was woven in Yazd in Iran and used by the ancient culture of the Zoroastrians for their ritual offering at the temple for birth, for celebration, and for commemoration of a life richly lived. We are fortunate to have people from Southeast Asia who are going to present their papers today, and we will know more about it, so you will be enriched by that knowledge. Unfortunately, we do not have a presentation from Japan of the Kasuri. And the the uh, Edric yesterday gave us the most beautiful story about the Kasuri, and he will talk about the Kasuri, as well as he will talk about the oldest ikat technique in Central Asia which was done in the Philippines on the abaca fiber and uh, by the Tibuli weavers who lived in the Mindanao island and were known as the weavers of the dream cloth as it was an interpretation of their dreams. And we knew also the extraordinary dream cloths 
which were woven by the women of the Iban tribe, about which Edric has written and researched. And I would like to just reach out to all of you that we need to work, to research. Not only that, but you also to use these fabrics in our lives, in our day-to-day -day lives, unless we use them. We can't keep them alive as they have been. And it is in our hands to keep them alive and in your hands to weave them for us. So it, we embrace the world, we reach out to everybody and today we are meeting here to bring together the practitioners and the students of Ekat and those of us who use the Ekat as a part of our life. So let us embrace all of us and hope to continue this tradition with your help, the masters, the masters who have maintained this tradition and all of us who have treasured it and people like Edric who have treasured it. Thank you. Thank you very much. She is my guru. And from the onset, when we first hosted the inaugural World Ecofiber and Textile Network the Forum in Kuching in 1999, we recognized that Jocelyn is the chief of our textile mafia. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just the little guy who tries <laughs> to copy her and run to her order. <laughs> anyway, it is also sometimes very emotional for us to remember and to recognize the contribution of people who from that year in 1999 when we initiated the WEFT, the World Eco Fiber and Textile Forum and Network. And, uh, but on the other hand, it is also very happy for me that the next generation is here also with us. At this juncture, I think, we would like to remember our dear friend, our dearly departed Dr. David Baradas. Those of you who know Dave, knows how impressive a personality he is, how tireless he has been in contributing to the furtherance of knowledge of the cultures of the Philippines and of Asia in general, and how though, even though he is such a public figure, and yet he led a very private life. And so when he departed from us, it was such a secret that even his closest friend did not know that he had gone, that he had gone to be the Lord, with the Lord. And it is only by chance and by accident that we've discovered that David had died two years ago. And so it is that today, as we mark these ties that bind Ikat Symposium, Ikat past, present, and future, but we recognize his contribution and how he has guided me and also supported me through all these years in running the WEF Forum. David, 
today we remember you. And let's just have a minute of silence in memory of David Baradas. Shall we stand and just eat? I can't. <laughs> And as we stand, we also want to remember also another friend of ours, an ikat weaver and a revivalist of Cordillera ikat weaving, the late Nadak Buyan. Thank you very much. Please be seated. I know I'm watching my watch. <laughs> I just have probably something very small to share after what Justine has shared about the ikat textiles, ties that bind, past, present, and future. And probably it is just to share with you this little story about not only what you see, but the unseen in the cloth. What you hold in your hands, what you wear around your neck, what you drape around your body. This is the physical presence of a fabric. But what is, as Justin has said, the unseen, the spiritual, is also as important. And many of us around in this room, my friend Melody, we are supportive of what we call slow fashion. Slow fashion is not a new concept. It has been around in India for years and generations and generations, ever since you wore the sari. Laila, it's an heirloom piece that never is thrown away. If it is torn, if it's stained, it is darned, it is restored, it is passed on from mother to daughter to granddaughters as heirloom pieces because there's been so much effort put into the weave. And when it's an ikat, the count that is the mathematician in the weaver the designer that lasts for generations. Ties that bind. We talk about ties that bind in Ikat. Not only binding us across the nations, across the continents, the five continents of the world, but ties that bind you from generation to generation to generation. It passes on. So the very depth of the meaning of ikat is precious. And this preciousness we treasure. We in Asia, we treasure this because it is close not only to our skin, but to our hearts and to our very spirit. It's a spirit cloth. And the spirit cloth is like this. As Bangi Embol, my master weaver tells me, the meaning in the curl, the definition of the tie that is so tight in defining a curl in an Iban Puakumbu. That curl is as small as a lady's thumb. That curl is tightly like the nail sticking to the flesh of your thumb. And that curl is like the tadpole that sticks to the fallen leaf in the flowing waters of the stream. And that curl, that ties that bind, is like friendship, never betraying one another. <laughs> Thank you very much.
right on the dot. <laughs> Um, I think that we have kept our time. <laughs> and if there are any questions, yes. <laughs> I enjoyed your talk very much, very, very much. You know, because I am not in textiles, I am not, <laughs> but really it. Can't, where is this? Uh, we can't hear. The sound system, please. Let me just turn it on. It's, yeah. uh, yeah. Can you hear yeah, yeah, me? Now yeah. we can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, when uh, you were talking about uh, Ikat uh, reaching Colombia, uh, uh, Peru, and uh, with the Spanish rights, Spanish uh, uh, people from uh, Spain, I was thinking of the ICAT coming from the East, from Southeast Asia to our part of the world, the Arab world and the Islamic world at that time, and the connection with Spain, because since the 8th century, Spain was so much involved in the Arab Islamic uh, culture in all its uh, uh, in, in all its features you know and all its art artifact uh, art and uh, so uh, we all know that the mayolica which has been appeared in europe uh, it was it came from spain and originally it came from iran you know down to uh, to all the Arab world, to North Africa, up to Spain, where it flourished there, and it was from Majorica, it went up to uh, France, to Firenze, that's why they call it Fayons. So I'm sure the textiles also, Icat must have gone the same way to Spain. And from there, maybe it went to Europe. And maybe by the Spanish also, it went to Peru, infiltrated no. to Peru. I want, uh, <laughs> this is what I thought. So I want Edric, because he is the one to talk, uh, I mean, about uh, how it uh, started in uh, Latin America. So I don't know. This you is my <laughs> my view, but I need the answer yeah. from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gada. You know, when we had the first World Ica Textiles Symposium in '99, and then I posed that question to Chaslin, <laughs> whether the origin of Ica could it have travelled from India through the trade routes through the migration of people groups to Borneo and to our Southeast Asian countries. And she says, don't be a fool, Edric. <laughs> I never the, said that. <laughs> <laughs> the ingenuity of your weavers, do not underestimate them. So long as they know how to weave, and there is a desire to create patterns on the threads, this is how it starts in the different continents of the world. For in fact, as Jocelyn has hinted, the Incas in South America, in the Paracas excavated textiles, which is now in the Museum of Pre-Columbian History in Santiago, Chile, they have little fragments of excavated textiles that shows Ikat was there. And they have, of course, the tapestry weaves, which is even more difficult. And so it's true that some of the techniques may have traveled, you know, through colonization. For example, in Ecuador, where maybe the Spanish have influenced the most simplistic kind of Ikat, but then they have then merge it with lace work in the fringes. 
But in Mexico, for example, I'm sure that they have inherited the technique that the rebozos that is so important in their cultural costume as the big shows is something that is with them for generations. And in Guatemala, you'll be surprised that even in Guatemala, they have double ikat. So we have some of these samples in the exhibition. But as Dr. Gada has said, yes, from Spain. From Spain, it went up to France. And the, and the collection that we have, which are historic in, from NIM, in the exhibition, a very nice indigo piece in NIM, could have been, again, a transference through trade and through influence that because it was the fashion of the day, they learned the technique and then it prospered and then they lost it. And so the only f nice pieces that you can find now of the NIM ikat in indigo blue was because it was brought over the ocean to America and ends up as the colonial cloth that they was popular in the new world. So it's very interesting how things happen and that is why we are here today to learn from one another and to discover more and to explore. It's a continuing journey. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Vantana. Yeah. Uh, is there a... <laughs> There's a mobile... <laughs> Uh, Rovi. Just now it was here. Yeah. You're being recorded, so. <laughs> Is it on? <clears throat> okay. Um, you mean to say Virali, for instance. Virali, which was used in Kerala, uh, that was used for the, uh, e uh, the ikat technique because, since there's no time to go into this, the belief is that uh, the ikat technique, or Patola, came from southern India and traveled up to Patan and was brought there because nowhere else in North India do you come across the uh, Ikat technique. You only come across it in the southern part and there you come across it as a part of the entire design or in borders, and it occurs again and again. So uh, we don't know. We still have not. But the work of the uh, the was which was done on Patola by the Salvis. The Salvis were originally, it is felt, came from Karnataka. And they were Jains. They are Jains. And the, uh, the, that they observed, they were the, uh, the sky clad. But when they came and were uh, part of the, uh, the tradition in Gujarat, then the 
the uh, image which they had brought, which they worshipped, which was sky clad, was wrapped in brass. So this is research which has been done by some uh, Jain scholars in uh, the United States and it's, it still is in progress. So we don't really know, but you are right that there are many uh, associations with it. The technique, like in Urissa, it's called Banda, and it it is it's an ancient technique. Again, can't go into it, but I can tell you. You know, you can come any time, <laughs> and we can go into the details. Then we have the Tilia Rumal to technique, and that technique of the cross within the cross, the sacred, the sacred grid, as we call it, is very important and is therefore very old. Uh, a lot of things emerge, and we need to have another discussion. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I didn't hear the word Austronesia mentioned in connection with Ikat. I think that is a very important source. And secondly, when you talked about what had been found in Peru and in Bolivia, you mentioned that they are a part of the pre-Columbian. Yes. I think we should do much more work we are not the products of colonialism. Our histories go back much earlier. And I think it's important to look at the past without the Europeans. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> Quite right. I think for a quick cup of tea and discussions can carry on over, over tea. Time. tea. Yeah. Thank you very much. Think, uh, Manju has a small gift for <laughs> Thank you. That was Thank nice. you. That was good. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Request you all to sit down so we can start our next session because as you know we are on a chop chop. Please settle down now. We are starting a session on Heritage Ikat. I'll introduce the speakers as soon as we have some order.
Second session on Heritage Ikat. May I request all the panelists to come on to the stage? Dinara, who is our chair for this session. Surupi, sorry. Thank you so much. Kun Surupi. Mr. Salvi, Mr. Salvi, hi. There's Rohit Salvi. Then we can go. He has sugar problems. Okay. Oops. Let's see you come here. Please, I should be in the middle. Yes. Kuma. Thank you. Here. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> can you see my mobile phone here? Yes, you can see it here. Yeah. All right. Are you okay? I'm okay. okay. Open it. Perfect. You have to stand here. Where is my one? Yes, one second. I'll just open it. No, no. It's the PowerPoint. No. And, and another one. This is also open. This is this the one. Don't see anybody here. Then, okay. Can we and we have the party. Uh, ask Edric. Ask Edric. Edric. They haven't come. Uh. Oh dear. Yes, because Can we please settle down? Just the back. Just the back. Leave that there. Um, our next session is on heritage textiles, being chaired by Kun Surupi Rojana Wangse, who has been involved in activities to develop and promote handicrafts for over the past 40 years, both at the national, which is Thailand, and international level. An ardent believer that arts and crafts are the solution to bring peace to the world with multiple benefits to all ages. Young, old, or differently abled, thus providing sustainable livelihood 
to women groups in the rural, uh, rural areas across the world. As founding member of the lifetime honorary chairperson of APADA, the ASEAN Handicrafts Promotion and Development Association, she collaborated with UNESCO Regional Office in Thailand to launch the UNESCO APADA Award of Excellence in Handicraft Products in 2001, followed by the UNESCO Award of Excellence and recently the WCC Award of Excellence. Mm -hmm. At the regional level, she served as president of the WCC APR from 2009 to 2012 and continues to act as an honorary advisor till date. During her term of presidency, she has initiated crafts and education program, which was essential to preserve the arts and crafts knowledge through our young generations. The next speaker is going to be Dr. Sitichai Samanchat, also <laughs> called Chai. He's a PhD in and an assistant professor, Faculty of Applied Arts and Architecture, Ubon Ratna Ch uh, Chantani University, Thailand, where he was, has taught for 10 years. Dr. Samanchat has a large corpus of research projects papers and books to his credit with subjects that include his area of specialization from Thai traditional textile history, mm -hmm. Thai ikat design and development, natural dyes, eco textiles and fashion, Siamese chintz, Shomuro Zome in Japanese collection, fiber arts to Indian textiles. With several honors, awards and distinctions to his credit Dr. Samanchat is on the advisory board and consulted to a number of institutions and organizations. He has traveled extensively to give lectures on his area of specialization in Thailand, India, and Japan. Thank you for being here, Doctor. The next speaker is going to be the Dinara Chochun Baiva. Began, she began as an educator, founding the Republican Center of Aesthetics Education in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, and then expanded her concern for promoting the value of intangible cultural heritage to a global stage. She is a Central Asian coordinator and member of international jury of the UNESCO World Craft Council Program award of excellence for handicraft products since 2004 <coughs> and director general of the <coughs> annual OIMO International Festival on traditional crafts and culture in Kyrgyzstan si since 2006. As a national expert on intangible cultural heritage, she was appointed as the head of the national working group to prepare files of Kyrgyz traditional felt carpet, alakiyiz and sherdak and Kyrgyz Kazakh Yurt have been inscribed into the UNESCO list of international cultural heritage in 2012 and 2014. And she's published a book on Sherdak in 2015. Thank you for being here. Unfortunately, the weaver from uh, uh, Margelan in Uzbekistan has not been able to come, and she would have had a conversation with him but now she's going to be talking to us uh, about ikat in the region. He couldn't come because he didn't get a visa. The next speaker we have is Merdi Sihombing, who you heard, you saw his fashion and you heard him sing. Right. So, he's going to, so he's going to sing through this presentation of his as well. He's a designer, is as alumnus of fashion design from Bunka School and Esmod Fashion Design School in Jakarta. Merdi Shohyambing has created <coughs> waves in the fashion world. Over the decade, his presentations include his design work themed bustier and fe the female undergarment that is commonly, commonly worn under the 
kebaya, the Indonesian traditional women's blouses for night or night dress. Early in his career, he received the Winnipeg Award. Merdi, who is Batak Ambon descent, began his study on visual art textile craft at the Jakarta University of Arts, UK. Uh, sorry, in IKJ, which led him to reflect on his Batak family name of Sehombing. This became his stepping stone on culturally induced fashion exploration, creating <laughs> works inspired by the traditional communities. And um, Mr. Salvi, Rohit Salvi is not here yet. He's not feeling well, but he'll join us shortly, and then we'll read about him a little bit. Yes. Thank, thank you very much, Manju. You have helped me introduce all the speakers. You still have to do your bit. I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to say now, except that welcome to the session today, and uh, lovely to see is fully packed. Thank you very much for being with us. We have heard this morning a very beautiful speakers and the word, I mean, the content that we have heard it was wonderful because even though I've been in promotion of arts and craft for 40 years over, I still learn some more. So I need to attend more session with you. And Edric, of course, we his words are so beautiful, both of them. It, it just um, give, give us word pictures. You can see what's happening you know, through their speeches. So here we are. We have uh, very important speakers here today. Um, Dr. Siti Chai from Thailand, and a colleague of mine. He's also a board member of Apada Thailand as well. So with the introduction has been said, may I ask you to speak now? Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my topic of uh, today's presentation is development of Madmi uh, Thai Ikat under the Queen Circuit Support Foundation. For this uh, paper, I would like to concentrate on the activity of the queens and also let you know the answer of the main pattern of uh, ikat in Thailand and also the method of the resisting technique in Thailand as well. So this is the map of Thailand that someone may be not visit yet. Please do in the future. The, the picture shows the queens uh, we see the the local river in the northeast of Thailand that uh, you can see that herself also developed the Thai ikat to be her dress uh, at a casual one and also for the uh, special for the gala dinner and for the evening dress also or state occasion she also tried to uh, make use of the Thai ikat to her life and to show uh, abroad how beauty of Thai ikat as well. Uh, this, uh, the picture also when uh, many years ago, more than 40 years, that the queens worked very hard for the weaver. You may not know that uh, she have to work up to 2 a.m as well during the trip for the uh, local weaver uh, workshop and give suggestion to them. This is why the Thai weaver, uh, how do you say, appreciates and uh, how do you say, love her so much. And the support foundation start Actually, it's for all kinds of carp in Thailand, but initially it's developed for the Thai matmi itself. So it's very important point to, uh, to me that to present the paper for Thai Ikas under her development. The next photo that I would like to show you the uh, 
uh, main pattern of Thai ikat that we classify into three groups. The first one we call the mirrored or uh, mirrored that the design uh, so composed by recurring the same pattern made out of the trace try to form the specific motif that you can see is uh, how to say it repeats the pattern again and again uh, so uh, the word of root is mean is continue the second one is me can that the name uh, adopted from the interweaving of horizontal stride and web ikat the number of the subtle used this case is more than that of mirrored or uh, mirai weaving because we have to insert the twist uh, yarn, the plain yarn, the ikat yarn, but the ikat yarn itself is not one set. Some, sometimes uh, they do the two or three sets or five sets as well to make uh, more beauty. The third one is Mirai. This is very, how to say, very unique uh, pattern and also is very complexity for the technique as well. The design is made in a brick pattern throughout the, the whole piece. The weaving method is more difficult than the Mirai or Mirai due to its complexity. That if they don't know how to weave, is return to the how to say the three angle pattern, not the, this uh, optic pattern at all. So this uh, secret of the weaver. And uh, this I would like to show uh, how the queens uh, develop Thai ikat to international market. That she asked the Brahman, the France designer, to develop her costume. Uh, by using Thai ikat. And also, uh, the, now we have the Her Majesty, the Queen Silicon Museum for textile at the Royal Paris that everyone can visit to show her, uh, how to say, to show the technique of Thai weaving and also to show the, her costume that she uses traditional textile and most of them mainly for Thai ikat and also uh, this the some fabric and some activity that she gives suggestion and also many designer many art teacher also work under her and for Honda for Honda her uh, house work uh, also uh, she award the series uh, from FAO uh, that uh, to recognize her uh, hard work for t uh, Thai textile development and uh, for all kind of craft that give the uh, better income and better life to the uh, Thai community. I would like to show how the Queen's promotion the Thai ikas to uh, how to say to make a better. This is some sample of the exhibition that uh, uh, we design uh, use a Thai ikat to display as a peacock. That's it will be the queens of the bird uh, that uh, will be uh, now is to be the symbol of the uh, Thai silk quality. That will be a peacock, gold peacock, silver peacock. Uh, and various peacock to recognize various kind of standard of Thai silk. The next is I would like to show during her, how to say, uh, she's still getting well. Uh, she will hold the special exhibition annually at the Phu Pans Parade in the northeast of Thailand. And we will exhibit excellently for the exhibition show that the textile uh, how to say, not just a skirt, but it's the art piece as the art exhibition. And you can see the, the sample that you can see the textile holding in the different uh, exhibition way that, uh, how to say, brand about the Thai art, something to inspire the weaver to learn that their textile is not just a daily piece, but it turned to be the art piece. 
and this another uh, sample of her competi uh, the competition under her uh, uh, foundation support. That this uh, not only uh, we uh, only the traditional pattern. She also asked the weaver to develop the innovative pattern. That some weaver uh, took a uh, Thai story or this the mother queens of the king uh, during she uh, hundred years old, uh, and also various subjects and depicted is uh, quite well. And that competition contribute to the development of uh, Thai ikat. And this for another one sample that uh, you, uh, how to say, in that time, many weaver, how to say, uh, use the chemical. Also, they have uh, the project to develop the natural dye. These are some sample. Uh, these are some dyeing material that, how to say, try to make a not only traditional pattern, also develop the contemporary composition. Uh, make it more simple, but it's uh, still, how to say, concentrate to intangible technique of Thai ikat. And this another pattern sample. Uh, not only for the develop the traditional textile, uh, we also have a project on the TV program to competition of the young designer, Tofa Patai, that uh, requests the young designer to visit the village, to understanding the textile technique, and turn to create the correction of the fashion show, and that competition get the how to say uh, increased knowledge of the young generation in Thailand about the uh, uh, Thai ikat. I would like to show some uh, renowned or some sample of uh, in Thailand this Sri Wandamrong or Shubatik that thanks to Ekdik that he uh, take uh, her correction to show at Santa Fe every year. And this you can see her and you can visit her website. The next is another one is in Korat that uh, Sumon Mai Thai is the Thai to depict a kind of contemporary way that the Thai Ikat can be. The next is the renowned, uh, how do you say, very known, delicate, super fine, exclusively, splendid. I cannot have a word to explain the beauty of this sample because uh, Mr. Mishai and uh, his mother, Miss Kampun Sisai, developed the, uh, how to say, innovative technique. He is uh, combined the uh, a kind of uh, tapestry, supplementary, into the Thai ikat that no one have done before. So the quality of the yarn also that very concerned to twist every uh, web to be very poppery before uh, to weave. That uh, many center uh, avoid no how to say. Uh, not maintain to do this high quality because it's consuming the the cost of production. So, but this center still practice the to preserve the high quality because the city of Won renowned for the super fine textile in in Thailand according to the King Lama Phi recognition in his letter. So this the sample, superfine sample. And now today, uh, you can turn the light. I will show you the three state of the development of some textile sample that I bring to show you. Uh, this one is the true hetero uh, Thai ikas. Please, someone can show them. Could you help me? OK. The second uh, sample, uh, okay, you can turn closely to them. Closely to them. Uh, no, show, show them. Turn aloud. <laughs> and the next one, please, is over there. Okay. Let, let them see, uh, see, see closely. Uh, and the next one is a three head door. You can see the development. 
this the in initially and this the uh, uh, the development one state and the last one is for hetero that is combined to Thai ikas. this is the most exclusive one and we need one nice. more volunteer mm. so uh, the quality that uh, how to say we concern uh, to develop the Thai ikat so uh, this the uh, how to say uh, today that uh, Thai ikat can be developed to today because the we have to thank to our queens that she worked so hard to develop the uh, the highway section and government section and the river uh, to inspire them to make the very how to say more better and better every year so this the this the answer why the uh, dedication of the peace is there mm. please uh, uh, help me to thank the queens by your cap please Okay. Any question for for this session? Please do. I don't think it works. Uh, we used to export some uh, textiles yeah, I think originally from Can you please uh, return to your seats now, please? Yes. Uh, Sarasa. Yeah, Sarasa. Uh, Come on, you designs coming in Jubika. Start the commotion here. Uh, it's not come directly. During that time, we have developed in the pattern. Ladies? Please, please sit down. Return the, the pieces. Thank you. Yeah, we do the question later. All right. Thank you. Shai, shai. Shai. Okay. All right. Each speaker has only 18 minutes, so please keep to your time. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> where, where is our timer? Timer? Yes, please keep time. I don't have the time. You have the clock, the watch. I can't just keep going off. It doesn't work. Okay, please start. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Sitichai. The next one is our dear Dinara. She will speak about the Central Asian. Uh, Mat me or Igat. Thank you. Please start. Thank you. First of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate everybody with such a wonderful event, which was initiated by our creative group, uh, Mr. Adri Kong and Mrs. Manjari Nirula, and which gave us such a joy and uh, I think it's really big input into this textile development in the world. And uh, 
My topic is Abrbandi, Ikat of Central Asia. Uh, tradition of Ikat of manufacturing fabrics on hand looms originated in Central Asia uh, from ancient times. And in northern Bactria, uh, it was uh, known in second, third centuries BC already. And in this wall hanging, wall. Um, Wall painted, um, wall painting. You can see the people wearing uh, ikat fabrics. I in Central Asia, semi silk and silk fabrics and cotton fabrics were produced by different groups of sedentary population: Tajiks uh, of autochthonic agricultural population, Uzbek Sarts, it is traders who are in their history have a significant layer of Iranian-speaking culture and Uzbeks direct descendants of the Turkic-speaking nomadic tribes. Uh, up now, you know, there is a kind of uh, competition be between Tajik and Uzbeks. Who started, who is who is owner of this technique, uh, Ikat uh, technique, Abrbandi Ar Ar technique, but, you know, if to see, to look for the roots of weavers, they are mostly Farsi-speaking people, uh, and we believe that, that it, it comes from Iranian, uh, from um, Farsi culture. Uh, and uh, in 19th century, in many cities and villages of Central Asia, with Tajik and Uzbek populations, the various fabrics of simple and complex interlacing were developed. Uh, such kinds of Bahmal, Moar Reb Sedras, Bey Kasab, Banoras, Atlas, Yakruya, Han Atlas, Duruya, Alacha. It is different kinds of um, fabrics uh, depending on techno different techniques and uh, um, material were used. And these fabrics were used for clothing and for house decoration, decorating. Mm -hmm. And uh, this Abrbandi name of this fabric uh, came from two words, Abr, which is translated from Farsi as cloud, and Bandi, bound clouds. Uh, Abrbandi is bound clouds. And there is very interesting legend that uh, it was one rich man Han, who wanted to uh, get married to a very young girl uh, to make her fifth, his fifth wife. And he, her father was very s upset of that, and he started begging that Han not do it. And he said, <laughs> okay, I will not take your daughter if you will create something more beautiful than she. And that <laughs> we were... Uh, and that weaver came uh, on the side of the river and seated there and watched the water. And suddenly he uh, noticed that uh, the clouds on sky were reflected on water and with some very interesting uh, contours and uh, shapes. And uh, he ran back home and created beautiful, uh, overnight he created beautiful textile, which we, uh, he called Abrbandi, which means that bound clouds. And when he presented that piece to Han, uh, he... Uh, refused to get married and uh, <laughs> got that piece of silk <laughs> and uh, um, gave that girl, uh, got that girl as a daughter-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> he got both. <laughs> so, and that is very mm, interesting legend and uh, uh, people like it. And if you will see the different uh, ornamental motifs in Abrbandi, you can, uh, uh, they have different names like Tumorcha, Amulet, Tarok, Komp, Gajak, Ornament, Urok, Sickle, Bodom, Almond, uh, Daracht, uh, Tree, Anor, Garnet, Oi, Moon, Shoh, Horn, Nogora, Timpani, Shakirim, Echo, and Kapalak, butterfly, etc., Scorpio, and so on. And here you can see three uh, such uh, ornaments. First is uh, Tumorcha, amulet, second is Bodom, and third is butterfly. And 
Today, the uh, manufacturing of Abrabandi, both hand and machine made, is concentrated on the territory of present Uzbekistan mostly, in the city of Margilan and nearby villages. Unfortunately, as it was told by mind you that our viva from Uzbekistan, very one of the very famous vivas, Nur Muhammad Waliyev, couldn't come because of this visa uh, problems, uh, but uh, he was really eager to come, and he's one of the best uh, creative vivas, and uh, viva in seventh generation, um, and um, uh, and he's from Margilan. But you know, in past, uh, the, mm, it is again competition between different cities. Uh, Bukharians said that it was started in Bukhara, uh, and um, but also historically, it is known that it was center was in Kokand village, uh, in Kokand uh, city. But now it moved to Margilan. Um, but in Bukhara, we know that Bukhara was always a trading center on the Silk Road, so all. Uh, things of craftsmen were brought by traders to Bukhara and sold there. That's why uh, many uh, like carpets or s um, fabrics were known as Bukharian because of trade uh, because of trading in that place. And also we have to mention Hujan city, uh, which is on territory of present Tajikistan. And now, unfortunately, in Tajikistan, this uh, is not as developed as uh, Abrabandi, is not as developed as in Uzbekistan, because um, you know, uh, economy of Tajikistan is very uh, poor, and it's not such a tourism developed as in Uzbekistan, Samarkand, and Bukhara. Uh, that's why. There is no m such a market in Hujan, but up now government is making a lot of uh, efforts uh, to develop this um, fabrics, Abrabandi fabrics, but mostly machine made. Uh, the most known uh, factory which unites uh, Vivas, both uh, who works with uh, um, hand uh, looms, uh, it is Yodgorlik fa factory in Margilan. And now it became a center for experimenting uh, with fabrics and many international uh, um, specialists and volunteers came into uh, to, uh, Margilan to work with Yodgorlik based on Yodgorlik factory. Uh, especially, you know, English uh, experts made a lot uh, to develop this uh, color palette for uh, which will m match uh, contemporary market demands. Uh, the material used for Abrabandi is cotton and silk. And cotton is uh, used of uh, local uh, breed, breed of cotton, uh, which is called guza, uh, uh, two kinds of uh, uh, cotton is used, are used, guza malla with a brownish tint and guza safet with white fiber. And uh, the spinning of yarns of uh, cotton uh, was a purely feminine job. But from mm, 19, uh, 1880s, uh, Vivas began to use machine-made cotton yarn. They just started buying it uh, from factories. Uh, and uh, silk threads, this work uh, was actually um, belonged to men, mostly. Um, and at the end of 19th century, a local breed of silkworms was bred in Central Asia. Um, and uh, uh, the largest workshops uh, were in Bukhara, Kokand, Margilan, and Hujant. Uh, the technology of obtaining silk consisted of steaming cocoons, as uh, everywhere, uh, in winding, uh, unwinding uh, and twisting of uh, filaments at special installations. Um, weavers used silk twisted from several cocoon threads, the number of which depended on the type of future fabric. And from the 1860s, women began to engage in silk worms using the same techniques and equipment as in cotton spinning. spinning. And uh, 
you see that uh, this um, ICAT uh, tie and die uh, technology is the same as uh, uh, everywhere. I mean, it is only not, not it's not double ICAT. It's only one uh, layer uh, ICAT. And uh, uh, here you can see family of very known. Um, Rasul Mirza Ahmedov family, uh, which uh, uh, is a uh, family of fifth generation of weavers uh, who work successfully on ikat uh, fabric weaving. Dyeing. Uh, people used uh, natural dyes. Uh, it is royan, roots of the mother, and uh, uh, is, uh, the plant is farak. Is farak. Uh, for yellow uh, color, and also there, there were some mm, uh, some uh, alum brow uh, and copper and uh, some uh, metals used uh, to mm, change the color, uh, but uh, the indigo dye was always imported from neighboring Iran or <coughs> India because we have no indigo in our uh, region. Weaving. All types of uh, fabrics uh, were produced in Central Asia uh, on the hand loom Dukon, uh, were produced uh, uh, of fabrics with uh, linen, twill, and satin weavers, as well of the velvet. Uh, the essential local and chrono chr chronological sign of fabrics was the width of the tissue. It depended on the type of the loom, the proportions of the human body, um, the design of traditional dress. It's usually ranged from 26 to 32 centimeters. At the end of 19th century, semi-silk fabrics, adras, bekasab, atlas, with a width of up to 50, 65 centimeters, <coughs> began to be produced in Bukhara, Margilan, and Hujant. And uh, you know that uh, also mm, the length of that uh, fabric was usually about uh, from 8 to 12 meters, uh, depending on the type of the dress was planned to uh, be produced. Uh, floating, in, in additional uh, uh, refinement of the dress, address, it means a uh, mixture of cotton and silk threads uh, fabric, was given by the glazing, which consisted in applying the moir sack by treating the fabric with a wooden ridged uh, hammer. As a result, the silk threads were flattened and at different angles uh, to each other created a moir app. Also, composition of uh, the egg, white, and apricot glue was used to cover, to cover uh, the fabric before beating in order to obtain a smooth and shiny surface. Here you can see this moir. So, and in uh, 19th century, production of Bahmal, velvet ikat, one of the most expensive and prestigious fabric, which for many centuries made the glory of Central Asian weaving, was concentrated in Bukhara, where it was produced in small quantities, but quite a variety of types, smooth dyed, stripped and with upper ornament, made of pure silk and mixed with cotton. But labor consuming and expensive manufacturing process contributed to the reduction of its production, which in the 1920s uh, just was finished. And here you can see the most, maybe, maybe the most famous family uh, producing uh, ikat factory in Uzbekistan and in Central Asia. It is family of Mirza Ahmedov. Here you can see this, uh, the head of this family in right, uh, Rasul, who got um, who received seal, uh, award of excellence of UNESCO for reviving of this bakmal um, ikat uh, velvet. So, and his father actually was uh, uh, very famous. Turdubai uh, Mirza Ahmedov was a very famous uh, weaver who started that process. And in 2005, uh, his son uh, continued that uh, work. 
so and you know that when we started as uh, <coughs> Edric reminded us when we started this process in 90s of reviving these uh, different uh, traditional techniques and technologies. You know, many people uh, looked at us as two crazy people and they said, oh, you want to revive this feodal feodalism. You want to come back to this past. Why don't you look to future? And uh, n not many people understood us. And when we wear this ikat and, uh, you know, traditional patent uh, clothes, people laughed on us, you know. And now you can see that uh, all Central Asia, not, not Central Asia, but whole the world, uh, followed that fashion, you know, using um, these uh, traditional patent uh, dresses. Uh, and uh, here it was, you can see the first steps of our designers of Central Asia uh, to use this uh, fabric, uh, Ikat fabric, Aberbandi fabric, uh, to use in fashion. And uh, at the names of, I want to mention some names of these people. It is uh, Lola Babaeva and Lola Safi from Uzbekistan, Tatiana Varatnikova and Dilbara Shimbaeva from Kyrgyzstan, Leila Haitova from Turkmenistan. And here you can, uh, you see uh, Aijan Bekulova from Kazakhstan. These people uh, started that movement you know, to promote uh, Central Asian Aberbandi in fashion. And here, in uh, the beginning of 21st century, you know, international designers, European designers, uh, uh, paid attention uh, to ICAT. And here you can One see uh, some Oscar de la, de la Renta started that. And, uh, after him, many uh, other uh, fashion designers, very famous fashion designers, started using that uh, fabric, uh, Central Asian uh, ikat, in their collections, and it became very popular. And here you can see how they used Uzbek uh, ikat in their production, and even in furniture, even in interior decoration and kitchen. Uh, and now it became even, you know, not as pretty as, you know, when people started to make print, uh, kind of, you know, uh, too much, too much, because it, it can be, uh, the value of ikat can be lost, I'm afraid, <laughs> that way. Uh, because people cannot recognize where is real ikat, where is just copy uh, or print. And today, new generation of designers of Central Asia, uh, such Said Amir or Altai Osmo or others uh, reinterpret the magnificent and uh, unique Aberbandi fabrics, the cultural heritage inherited from our ancestors. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right on the dot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, actually, we, ah, we have the next speaker coming. I think it's wonderful to hear your speech very much, how it travels on different type of uh, uh, products. You know, it's very useful. Um, may, may I now invite uh, the next speaker, Mer Mercy. Mercy. Shi Hong Bing, Shi Hong Bing here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to everybody here. Previously, I wanted to ask you all to say Emma Tutu. Okay, follow me. Emma Tutu. Emma Tutu. Once again, Emma Tutu. Okay, after reading all lyric from my tribe Batak, and then you said Ematutu. Okay? <laughs> Baliga mapagabe to madak konsi taodoan. Arita magabe molo masipolo oloan. Once again. Arita magabe 
tumada konsi tau doan. Ari tamagabe mulai masih pauloruan. Thank you, you got it. <laughs> Usually the relics done by the weavers so that they can work with the spirit and get the strength and soul in weaving. Thank you. So my presentations, revitalizing and reinvention ulos from the heritage for the fashion. Ulos in the Indonesian preservation movement. Heritage is a legacy from the past which is very valuable and have to be preserved and passed to the future generation. The legacy contains historical value and thought of the makers, the creation and idea quality. Heritage has a very important part in the human life continuation. According to the 2003 Indonesian Heritage Preservation Chapter, Indonesian heritage are natural, cultural, and intangible. Natural heritage is a special natural formation, the result of unique idea, sense, intention, and work from more than 500 tribes in the archipelago as the union of the Indonesian nation in its interaction with other cultures. Intangible heritage is the combination of natural and cultural heritage in a certain time and place. In 2013, the Indonesian preservation movement have a reach in the second decade. The achievement is marked by a lot of preservation activities in the region and more development in natural, cultural, and intangible heritage aspects. The extraordinary achievement is also distinguished by increased appreciation and use of traditional textile craft from region in Indonesia. Thus, the year 2013 is also celebrated as the Indonesian Heritage Years. Preservation community celebrates it with various activities in accordance to their need and capacity. Ulos as an immaterial cultural heritage. Ulos, it means blanket. The local heritage in the ever is one of the link in this chain that have the potential to elevate the society's welfare through creative economy activities that have started to grow across Indonesia. Batik started it attracting attention for its development, not a product that fulfills a local demand, along the development into a larger international market. Batik, which initially was produced with care by women in village on Java Island, is an immaterial cultural heritage that can encourage community growth well. The success of batik leads to the surfacing of traditional textile from other region. One of them is Ulos Ikat from Batak tribe, from my ancestor, which had been receiving support for a long time from a very talented young artist, Merdisi Hombing. Give applause to me. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Ulos that come from my hand, surfaces full of spirit and still attention from many. With persistence and focus has elevated the unique textile of my homeland, North Sumatra. Ulos preservation is very dependent on the continual and necessary use of Ulos is every Batak traditional activity beside also becoming a local identity that has been making its own name. Thus, Ulos is an immaterial cultural heritage that imply the Batak original cultural fundamentals. Various Ulos depict the philosophy of strength of the Batak people character. A view into Ulos centuries old traditional values. 
Ulos is a daily outfit of the past. In a time when Batak people were yet familiar with textile from outside their area. Men wore ulos on the upper part of the body. Worn this way, the ulos was called hade hade. It's like me. This is hade hade. <laughs> no, I use with this, we call it hande hande. <laughs> One on the lower part was called a sikot. Sorry. Sorry, like this. One on one as a head cover, it was called tali tali or detar, like this. This is a tali tali. The woman wore ulos on the lower part of the body and the upper part of the breast. One this way, it was called hain. One as a back cover, it was called hoba hoba. One as a it was ape ape. One as a head cover, it was saung. If a woman carry a child on her back, the back cover was called ho hop ho hop. Yeah, in the back ho hop ho hop. Ulos used to bound the child onto her body was called paropa like this. Not at all. Ulos are worn in a daily life because ulos also represent the spiritual world of Batak people. Ulos is a part of tradition and traditional ceremony. It is a symbol of an event. It represents the individual status and the social status of each user. Ulos is highly valued in a Batak traditional ceremony. Before, it is impossible to discuss about Batak tradition without mentioning ulos. In the past, weaving ulos must follow certain rules. The length, the length and the width must rigidly follow a rule. which must not be divine. There are prohibition and regulation during the making of an ulos. For example, weavers is not allowed to leave the village carrying half done ulos with an intent to complete it all in other village. If the code is broken, tondi or the spirit of the woman cloth will be gone. With such an adherence, the quality of ulos of the past is clearly better than of today. A change in ulos value began with the influx of modern culture into the Batak land, broke by missionaries and that's colonial official. Batak ancestors began copying European fashion like shirt, shoot, pan, dress, and woman tops. Ulos, which used to be worn daily, began less frequently used. They spend more time kept, used only on a certain moment as a traditional tool. The Dutch colonial government and missionaries also attempted to erase the authority of Batak kings slowly. All attributes related to the royals were also gone. This include ulos, like a number of ulos kind that is worn only by royalties. The wife and children, and also the rich and important people. Nowadays, only a number of main ulos remain and easily recognized by the Batak community, especially those that are related to the traditional ceremony. Ulos then were mass produced and sold cheap because it is only used for the ceremony. A revitalization is need to return ulos as a value and respected cultural artifact, but is still able to face change of time. This is my reason to focus on, on ulos seriously, digging and bringing up again to surface the cultural value inherent in it. And at the same time, explore ulos for its future in the Indonesian and global textile competition. According to the Batak tradition, ulos has a symbolic function that accompanies humans from their birth until death. There are three important events in life in which ulos are given. At birth, at birth rate, wedding, and all that. 
the ulos givers, the type of ulos given, and people who are also given ulos are all regulated by the traditional law. They are very used all of ulos based on the ceremony that use them, status and identity. There are over 50 kinds of ulos according to the elder. They are that only worn by special people or at special event, so that they are rarely seen in the daily life. This kind of ulos is called ulos homitan, store ulos. The general population of Batak community may not know well about ulos. There are five ulos homitan that still exist today. Ulos jugia, this is I re, re, uh, revitalize ulos jugia. This time was uh, lost. Beside the five ulos, there are a number of main ulos that is more popular because they are used in a daily life, both for ceremony and traditional symbol of the daily outfit. Among them are ulos sibolang. Ulos sibolang is uh, ulos indigo, a blue ulos, uh, toba blue. Remember? <coughs> ulos suri suri ganjang, ulos mangiring, ulos bintang maratus, bintang maratur, ulos sitolutuho, ulos bolean, ulos jukit, ulos harungguan. Revitalizing and reinventing ulos. New value and face of Batak weaving. Ulos Batak is a weaving product of a class apart from its traditional and sacred value. The woven cloth is special because it utilizes all elements are ikat warp. We call it gatip or height. Supplementary warp or jugia, supplementary web, jukit or dukit, tapestry. The weakness of original batak ulos is its stiff material and easily become moldy. Its color are also rigidly, rigid. Using only the main three colors, red, black, and white rendering is not suitable to cater fashion demand. The global trend nowadays start in all ethnic cultural ideas. It's a good momentum for ulos to be accepted widely, not only nationally, but, uh, but also globally. Good quality, attractive motif and design, and ancient traditional value will make the traditional Batak textile a highly valued choice. In order to achieve that, creativity is needed in the process of making, communicating, and packaging. All this can be done as a part of the revitalization effort. This is what I have been attempting to do in the past 10 years. In the revitalization effort, I maintain the traditional value in the Batakulos while introducing a number of change and innovation in thread spinning, coloring, weaving, twinning, and not replacing loom that were inherited by ancestors who existed more than hundreds of years ago with more modern loom on the ground of wanting to make them into industry in order to produce faster production. I reinvented the ulos by modifying <coughs> the motif composition especially on the motif ikat and supplementary web. Ikat motif which I usually put in the middle now is made into decorative variety on the all part of the cloth. This motif variation and modification give a new look in the weaving, but it retain the ulos look. One of the important issues in reinvention the batak ulos involved me modifying the loom to create wider cloth. Splicing the cloth are no longer necessary after widening the batak tradition loom from 60 centimeters to 100 five centimeters. This, modifi this modification produces new woven cloth of ulos with softener texture and more beautiful and varied colors, accommodating the demand and development of the fashion world. More importantly, the new ulos are like and are fulfilling the taste of people who initially do not understand ulos. This is the target of ulos modernization that the national Batak ulos is, as, is accepted by all circles. Inspiration and myth and legend. The Ulos Batak tradition have been going going on for hundreds of years and has priceless value. It is not only about the art but also philosophies it carries. 
Ulos is actually the representation of the spiritual world of Batak people. Therefore, revitalizing Ulos is processing Ulos into a new form. In revitalizing the Ulos, I try my best to not erase the unique characteristic, philosophy, and traditional values in Ulos weaving. This is the reinventing process that I have done as an important implementing aspect in order to keep as high class product value by its legacy strength. One way to understand the philosophy and traditional value is by studying history, by reading and asking questions, learning various myths and legends of the Batak society. I found a lot of inspiration from myth and legend. One of the most prominent myth of Batak people is Buru Dayak Parujar, a goddess daughter of the heavenly Batara Guru or the god. She is known the ultimate master weaver of Partunu Nautusan. She is the goddess who reviews married arrangement with Mangalabulan and choose to leave the heavens. She descends from heaven using the thread made from Turak, a thread roll used in a weaving. On earth, Borudia Parujar continue weaving what on inherit the skill to have female distaste dance. The mythology speaks how important Ulos is for the life of Batak people. Ulos is not only an outfit but also a medium that connect, that connect them cosmologically and spiritually with Mula Jadi Nabolom, the great creator. The Boru Dea Parujan made give me many inspiration in creating textile and designing fashion. Sustainably for the future. In this spirit of sustainability and going green, I have one support from Lansing from Austria. I am using eco-friendly model and micro tensile threads produced by Lansing, a company in Austria, for my ULOS revitalization, reinvention, and also support from Crystallized Swarovski in a company from Austria. Meanwhile, changes in the world have affected also the Batak weaving world. The classic problem of financial had led young weavers to abandon the craft threatening the, the regeneration of the art. They are lured into making money through less hard work and more income. Without activity and new blood, Batak weaving standards are facing that. Weaving used to be a mandatory skill for Batak women, but now it is being neglected. The women used to adhere to the old tradition, but they do not more. Young women are faced with the difficult choice to adhere to traditional guidance or answer the calling of the modern world. Temptation, the latter came out as a winner, luring them to leave the village, working as maid abroad or looking job in the big city. Only the older women stay in continue weaving. The people... Sorry. The people now, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> okay. The people, some problem is being faced by Indonesia traditional community across the archipelago. So, for me, becoming a designer is not only to enjoy the fruit of my works, but also having the willingness to develop them, the weavers, so that they can compete on the international world. It will not be end of a statement to say that Indonesia has a one-of-a-kind treasure of traditional textile reference. A thorough research is imperative in order to understand it. This is what we are going complete with getting to know the cultural actors and the supporting environment. Preserving ulos is not merely preserving the cloth, but is also related with the philosophy, identity, and process of producing the craft. As that, it demands contribution from many parties to protect, prevent from damage and vandalism, maintain and preserve, of, and of course promote and appreciate ulos on the regional, national, and global level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are doing very well with time. And, and now, may I invite Edri Gong to speak with no? No, not yet. So, uh, and now it's a question and answer. So, any questions to the, any of the speakers? Yes. 
Thank you for this wonderful presentations. Learned a lot. My question is to you, Central Asian. Uh, you mentioned about the different symbols, amuletic and you know things like that. My question is related to that in terms of the symbols, whether different groups that you use these cuts is a separate production about colors, the patterns, and you know these uh, different symbols, or is it a common template that all the groups, whoever uses, uh, you know, abra bandi, whoever uses it has the same set, similar set of things, or is a specific production for s different sets of groups by way of different color palette, by way of a different design, and by way of using symbols that are specific to a, uh, an ethnic group. I'm sorry if my answer will not complete, completely um, will not un uh, will not uh, be perfect, uh, perfectly uh, completed because I'm not a viewer. I cannot give you um, exact information. Mm. But uh, on that, uh, if this, there is a difference between understanding of different symbols by Uzbek, by different groups of producers in different mm. areas, might be might be some different understanding as I can compare just with our Kyrgyz uh, producers of our um, patent uh, woven carpets that in different areas uh, they uh, name, they give different names to the same uh, patterns and they put different meaning in the same uh, uh, same patterns because uh, by the, you know, it depends of the geographical uh, geographical position, I think. But mostly, because uh, especially now when people uh, have more chance to uh, exchange information and to share information, including these uh, new uh, technologies, I mean, uh, internet, etc., uh, it's kind of uh, unified, I believe. Thank you. Any more questions? No, I don't think there. there uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Edric. Not uh, so much a question, but uh, maybe uh, information. If you go to Do the exhibition. Excuse me? If you go to the exhibition, there is a beautiful black dotted <laughs> velvet by Rasul on exhibition there. Now, we are not sure whether it is contemporary or whether it is derived from traditional, the black dot. But just to tell you that that was what was then used by Gucci in his collection. So it became a global uh, symbol for one particular uh, velvet collection that was launched. Uh, but the also the other thing, yeah, the, the other imp interesting thing is that then, the ready-to-wear collection was not hand-woven. Yeah. It was yeah. just printed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next one, please. Hi, Textiles. Um, I wanted to know whether you did use the supplementary weft in the, in the supplementary weft or in the design. Was there any kind of a jacquard that you're using? No, is the... The weave, the twill and the... Uh, is almost hand woven. The uh, how to say? The insert according to the pattern. Yeah. So there's uh, so uh, so no no jacket at all. <laughs> they have a uh, handle like this. Is uh, we have uh, eight handle to lift the. So is it a dobby? Plant. Is it a dobby? No. No. It's just a shaft. It's just a shaft. Yeah. It's just a shaft. It's okay. a shaft. Yeah. Was the tie and dye done in the traditional way, or was it? It looks very complex. Uh, so it's the it traditional a way uh, of tying yeah. on the warp. Uh, bec uh, because this kind probably is uh, how to say is come to complex because the set of the pattern mm -hmm. it tie in uh, three or five set mm -hmm. continue. Mm -hmm. It means is the the frame of uh, the resisting mm -hmm. tying for the pattern. 
they make a three or five set mm -hmm. and the same size and then the pattern is can uh, weave into one single piece this is the complexity of the technique mm -hmm. that be developed thank you thank you is, is it all silk yes all silk uh, manbury manbury Not, not no. at all. We like to <laughs> not at all. Yes, okay. It's already test and it's already have the seal institution for guarantee. So, it's, it can test. It can examine because we have to investigate the, the production. Uh, if for the synthetic, uh, it's not the ikat at all, it's the printing that available for the common one it just a kind of uh, what that uh, 500 rupees something is available for for the local market just for the commoner but not for the craft uh, piece like this thank you Uh, few, uh, because few, uh, it traditionally we have the uh, what that four or eight shaft handle to be a plain one. Uh, later, under the Queen's development and under the development of the uh, Ministry of Industry for textile, uh, my colleagues uh, try to merge them between the four and eight handle. Of a plain weave, when we how to say we apply the uh, true head it got to the eight to uh, four to eight head uh, to weave the ikat. So the ikat is made is more complex because we combine two fabric into one. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Can yeah. we carry on this discussion outside because we are yes. I think the time is up. Uh, thank you very much for your interest and questions. I think you are, if you need more explanation outside, all right? So I think what we have uh, heard from the three speakers, we can see that definitely we need to use all the traditional crafts. Yeah, I think it's just beautiful and we have to maintain the technique, the traditional technique and the designer can innovate and do something new like Mercy has done. I think it's wonderful so that uh, still using the, the same loom but innovate the pattern in such a way that it can be woven more, you know, to increase the production. And uh, Dinara has explained how it's being used from the very beginning and how it's being used in the different areas in the Central Asia. It's very interesting. Uh, I think you have to really visit these places, you know, to understand and appreciate. Next time we come and see you. All right. And Dr. Siti Chai also explained how our Majesty the Queen of Thailand has been the, has started to revive all this ikka, you know, in Thailand. And it's doing very well, and it, the, the people are continuing to use it. And I'm very happy that, uh, I think the younger generation are also uh, interested to do more. And this is coming to the program that I, to my heart, that the craft and education, I think, you know, sustainability, we need younger generation. And I, I'm so happy to see a few of you here at this time. So I hope we see more of you, the young people, and we can increase. I think we, we have to get the activities going again in the sub-region, you know, that to bring, bring the, the people together. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Surupi. Thank you, all of you, for a wonderful, wonderful session.
lunch is now served. It's unfortunate that Rohit Salvi has not been able to come, but when he does, we will accommodate him whenever he is here in the next session. So you will get to hear him. So I hope he gets well soon. So lunch, and we will all be back here at 1.35. And Edric, I would request you to please. We can do that after.